Very good morning. Uh, the first session is on tests of GR, and the chair is uh, Yan Bai Chen. Welcome to the session. So this is the first session of today. Uh, the topic is tests of GR and strong gravity. Uh, we'll have three speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Chris Vandenbroek. He's from uh, NICAF and uh, Utrecht University. OK, thank you very much. Uh, also, it's an honor to be here at this meeting to uh, celebrate the life and work of uh, Bala. Uh, uh, kind thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So indeed, fundamental physics with gravitational waves. Um, so basically, and in particular, gravitational waves from coalescing binaries is what this talk will be about. And so <clears throat> basically, I'd like to see if we can address three questions. So one is the nature of gravity. Um, if, if general relativity is incorrect, even at the classical level, which is possible, then uh, uh, what, al what alternative theories can we uh, look for? Um, a, a somewhat related question is the nature of compact objects. These very heavy objects, several uh, solar masses or tens of solar masses that we saw collide, are they really the black holes of general relativity? In some alternative theory, they, they might be uh, still black holes, but with different properties. Or even if you stay within general relativity, there could be objects like boson stars that are extremely compact and nearly black holes, and therefore black hole mimickers. And then finally, uh, we will see that we will also be able to say something about the nature of dark matter. I should say that, uh, in part at least, this talk is based on the work by uh, tens of people in the GWIC 3G uh, science case team. Um, so first, the nature of gravity. Um, this plot uh, is uh, rather telling, uh, in my mind at least, so let me first uh, tell you what you're looking at. So you have an M and an L here, which are the, the mass and the uh, characteristic size of some system. It uh, could be anything, could in particular uh, be binaries. And the y-axis gives you a measure of uh, the strength of space-time curvature. And the x-axis give you, gives you something like the Newtonian potential, which in the case of binaries goes like v squared over c squared, where v is the characteristic velocity with which the, the binary is moving. So as you go to the right on the x-axis, you get to more and more dynamical situations. As you go up on the y-axis, you get to uh, stronger and stronger space-time curvature. Then we live in the solar system. We live in the most boring corner of this plot down here. And gravitational wave observations are uh, top right, strongest space-time curvature, and most dynamical situations. Um, now, on the theory side, there is something called Lovelock's theorem, and I'm not going to read the sentence here, but in a nutshell what it says is that um, if you stick to four space-time dimensions and you want the dynamics to be governed by the metric and up to second uh, derivatives of, of a metric, but not any other field, uh, also, if you want to construct from that metric um, uh, something that is uh, divergence-free so that you can have a notion of stress energy conservation, if also you want diffeomorphism invariance or general coordinate transformations, then pretty much the only dynamical equations that you can write down are the Einstein equations with the possible inclusion of a cosmological constant. Now, uh, coming from different motivations, such as quantum gravity, or maybe the desire to uh, explain dark energy or dark matter in a dynamical fashion rather than, than invoking a new kind of particle, uh, people have uh, looked at what happens if you relax all of the several assumptions, one or more of the several assumptions that go into Lovelock's theorem. And what you find then is that uh, there's, there's a whole zoo of alternative theories of gravity that open up. Um, so, for instance, if you want to go to higher dimensions, uh, then Lovelock's theorem, uh, 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 well, you don't just have to have the, the Einstein equations, so string theorists might be interested in that, for example. Uh, or you can introduce extra fields that govern gravity other than the metric, and uh, then you end up, for instance, you can add scalar fields and vector fields. You typically also get additional polarizations uh, on top of the usual tensor polarizations. You can also have scalar and vector polarizations of gravitational waves, and so on. Now, I won't go into uh, 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 this plethora of theories, but an important point is that for most, if you know, I guess, all alternative theories of gravity, there doesn't really exist a full in-spiral merger ring down waveform model for gravitational waves, and certainly not uh, a model of the same quality as what we have uh, for uh, standard general relativity. 
And so in practice, what we do is model independent tests. Now, what does that mean? It means that you start from the waveform of general relativity. And <clears throat> if you look at the mathematical expression of the waveform at strategic places, let's say, you allow for deviations associated with some extra parameter. <clears throat> and so basically you allow for deviations away from general relativity. And what you're doing then is not test any of the alternative theories. You're testing general relativity itself, which of course in the present era is a rather natural uh, point of departure. Um, now here's an, uh, one example of such a, a model independent test. This was already shown yesterday, I think, but let me go through it uh, briefly again. So for instance, the post-Newtonian description of the in-spiral phase, the phase as a function of velocity can be expressed uh, as an expansion in V by C, like so. And then the, the, the pre-factors, the coefficients in, in this expansion are uh, predictions of general relativity. They are, they are specific functions of masses and, and spins of the two components of the binary. Um, and then also merger ring down can, uh, can be uh, characterized by extra parameters. And then you can allow one by one for each of those parameters deviations and then see if you can constrain those deviations, which in the case of general relativity, uh, so uh, these deviations should be zero. And so this is the, the, the state of the art right now. On the x-axis, you see all of the post-Newtonian orders, 0 pn, 0.5 pn, 1 pn, 1.5, and so on and so forth. There's also a minus 1 pn, which doesn't exist in general relativity, but can uh, be connected um, with dipole radiation. Um, and then the different types of markers in each case are different events, different gravitational wave detections of binary black holes uh, that were used to put constraints. Now, an important point is you can combine information from all of those different events that you see to arrive at a stronger constraint. And the diamonds, usually at the bottom here, are those stronger constraints uh, that you obtain. Now, uh, this is a meeting about the future of the field. So regularly, I'll indicate uh, how third generation detectors, so next generation ground-based or uh, LISA uh, will improve uh, on results. And uh, 3G detectors will improve in two, in two ways two obvious ways in a sense. So on the one hand, uh, the same sources will appear louder in a 3G detector, and 3G detectors will also see many more sources which you can combine information from. So for instance, in the case of Einstein Telescope or Cosmic Explorer, we expect uh, over the course of several years in the order possibly of 100,000 sources. Um, here's another example of uh, a mostly model independent test. Uh, uh, here we look at the gravitational wave propagation. Um, what you do here is you allow for an anomalous gravitational wave dispersion relation. So the quote unquote graviton would, would satisfy E squared is P squared C squared where E and P are uh, energy and momentum. But you can, you can introduce this extra term here, which goes like momentum to some power alpha. And this prefactor A gives you the strength of the violation of the ordinary uh, dispersion relation. Now, uh, the case alpha equals zero corresponds to a massive graviton because then just the cons a constant A is being added, which you can relate indeed to the uh, mass of the graviton. Um, now, what you, ha what you have to imagine in this case, uh, we're talking about classical waves, of course. We're not actually talking about particles in, in terms of what we observe. Uh, but if the, if the uh, graviton were to have a mass, then what happens is that the high frequency components will, of a wave will travel faster than the low frequency components. And both will travel slower than the speed of light. But in any case, uh, you will get a deformation of the wave, which builds up over the large distances that the wave has to travel from the source to the detector. And so you can dig very deep, in a sense. And so you can, in particular, put a very stringent constraint on the graviton mass of 5 times 10 to the minus 23 electron volt is the current bound. And then for alpha uh, different from zero, uh, this extra term here uh, it corresponds to vi violations of local Lorentz invariance. Um, and then you get uh, uh, for this uh, size A of the violation, you get similarly impressive bounds in the appropriate units 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 20. Um, in this case, 3G detectors will improve also because of the much higher distance to which you can see things, and therefore you can see signals that will have propagated over larger distances, and whatever anomaly in terms of dispersion is present will have built up even more. Um, <clears throat> secondly, so that was um, uh, 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 the nature of gravity. Now we, now we come to the nature of compact objects. 
So again, um, when thinking of these, these tens of solar mass binaries that we saw merge and that we very clearly saw gravitational wave signals from, how, how certain are we really that the component objects were black holes, or, or rather the standard black holes of uh, general relativity, Kerr black holes? And there's a whole bunch of alternatives called black hole mimickers that have been proposed in the, in the literature with various degrees of well-motivatedness, if that is a word. Uh, but in any case, for instance, there's boson stars, which are sort of uh, stars made, made out of uh, scalar fields. Um, if dark matter is composed of uh, fermionic particles, then you can imagine them forming as, as, you know, star-like objects held up by fermionic uh, degener degeneracy pressure. Uh, then there are some weird ones, like gravistars, which have a de Sitter core, which wants to expand, but it's held together by a shell of matter, wormholes, firewalls, fuzzballs, and so on. And very importantly, there might be some alternative to black holes that uh, uh, is not yet in the literature because nobody has thought of it yet. And so we want to search for, for uh, evidence uh, uh, of this. Now, the first way of searching for evidence for alternatives to black holes is by looking at the in-spiral, and there's a number of, effect, of, of effects that appear there. First of all, <clears throat> uh, when two objects get close together, um, suppose they were new, ordinary neutron stars, then we know they undergo tidal deformability because we have already uh, seen evidence of that uh, uh, in uh, the detection of uh, 2017 of binary neutron stars. But also for these exotic objects, you might get tidal deformabilities. Um, uh, it is, uh, as we saw yesterday, a fairly high PN order effect. 5 pn order. On the other hand, the brief factor goes like the inverse compactness to the fifth power and can therefore be a rather large uh, number uh, for, for very compact objects. And in this case, three, three G detectors will be able to distinguish neutron stars from boson stars, even for the most compact models uh, uh, for the latter. Another kind of effect you can get is spin-induced uh, quadrupole moments during in-spiral. So what is that? Well, imagine one of the two component masses is spinning. Then uh, if it is uh, a material object, then it can form a, 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 a centrifugal bulge. It, it gets swished, squished because of the spin. And so that, is, that gives you a quadrupole moment. And the effect of that can also be seen uh, uh, starting at uh, 2 p.m. This will be very hard to access with uh, 2G detectors, but uh, 3G measurements will be possible uh, down to a few percent in terms of uh, the relevant parameter here. And then there's other things like tidal heating and so on. So that's InSpiral. At the end of InSpiral, the two objects merge. And uh, if they are just black holes, they will merge and then uh, you, uh, you get a highly excited single black hole, which eventually undergoes what we call ring down. And that will allow to test the, or indirectly test at least, the so-called black hole no hair conjecture, which says that stationary vacuum black holes are completely determined by mass and spin. We leave out charge here. Astrophysical black holes are not expected to uh, have charge. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, of course, um, this black hole no hair conjecture uh, cannot, be, cannot be tested directly with gravitational waves because stationary black holes uh, do not emit uh, <laughs> gravitational radiation. However, during this ring down process of a newly formed uh, uh, object, uh, you have a superposition of ring down modes, each coming, so basically you have a superposition of damped sinusoids, each coming with a particular characteristic frequency and characteristic damping time. And all these frequencies and all these damping times are dependent upon just two numbers, namely the mass and the spin of the final black hole, in the case of a standard black hole of general relativity. And these relationships are known. And so this is sort of the fact that, that you have a dependence on just these two numbers is sort of, you can view this as a kind of a reflection of the uh, black hole no hair conjecture. Now, on the other hand, the amplitudes in here, they do depend on how this remnant black hole came into being. And so that uh, those amplitudes are going to depend on the masses and the spins of the uh, progenitor uh, binary uh, objects. But increasingly, um, uh, with input from NR simulations, people have come up, are, are coming up with models for those amplitudes. But the focus will be on these dependencies here. And so, one, what one can do is uh, very much like uh, the post-Newtonian tests of the post-Newtonian parameters. You can allow for relative deviations in the dependencies of uh, these all these frequencies and damping times on mass and spin, and so these delta omegas and delta taus uh, you can measure and constrain. So you let them vary in turn, and you measure them together with all of the other parameters in the problem: masses, spins, sky position, uh, whatever else. 
Um, and what has been shown in simulations is that if we have advanced LIGO and Virgo at design sensitivity, we are still a factor of a few away from that. And if you had just six sources similar to GW150914, then uh, already you would be able to measure the frequency of the 2 to 0 mode down to 2% and uh, damping time uh, down to uh, 10%. So in that sense, um, you, it's, it's not necessary to, you know, in order to test the no hair conjecture, it is not necessary to be able to pick apart all the different modes. Now you can throw them all together, but then introduce possible deviations in, in, in these frequencies and damping times and come to interesting results. And then there's uh, also thoughts of going beyond the linearized regime, because ring down uh, pertains to linearized regime, but before ring down and right after merger, you're in a strongly nonlinear regime, and that may be uh, used as well. Uh, however, the advantage of 3G detectors will be that you will be able to pick apart all of these modes. And now you know that, again, all of these uh, uh, characteristic frequencies and damping times are dependent upon uh, only the mass and the spin of the final black hole. So only two of these many omega LMN and uh, tau LMN are independent. And by comparing any three of them, you can check for consistency. And that is what is illustrated here. So basically, you have uh, mass and spin of the final black hole here, and these bands here give you measurements of uh, the 2-2 two, two frequency, 2-2 two, two damping time, 3-3 three, three, uh, frequency, and you have these bands coming together uh, in a patch that contains the true value of mass and spin, in the case that, of course, the, the no hair conjecture is satisfied. Um, another way of uh, 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 looking at the properties of a remnant object and see to what extent it is consistent, to a, uh, consistent with the standard black hole is um, gravitational wave echoes. Now here the idea is uh, if you have an exotic object that has some inner bound boundary that is, is sticking out so you don't have a black hole, ingoing gravitational radiation is not being absorbed instead it is being reflected, um, then you can have uh, echoes uh, which are bursts of radiation that come out at regular times. Now, uh, imagine that this horizon modification or replacement of horizon that you need for this has a characteristic length scale L. And uh, if in geometric units this uh, length scale is much smaller than the mass of the object, then uh, the, the uh, echoes will come out at set times, at regular time intervals. Uh, and this is what the time interval looks like. So it goes like uh, the mass itself. It is only uh, logarithmically dependent on this uh, horizon modification length scale. And then there's this prefactor here, which is set by the nature of the object. So for instance, n equals 8 for wormholes, n equals 6 for thin, thin shell, gravistars, and so on, and so forth. And so as an order of magnitude estimate, take the mass of GW159914 and take the horizon modification scale to be the Planck length and n equals 4 as an arbitrary choice, then you will see that the time interval between echoes is in the order of 100 milliseconds, which is good news, um, because on the one hand, that is much longer than the, the ring down time, than any of the ring down time scales. Um, but on the other hand, it is not a million years. So you, you, you have a hope to actually uh, uh, dig into the data and start looking for these things. Um, and then finally, and this is, uh, here we return to general relativity. Um, we can also say something about the nature of dark matter using uh, compact objects. Uh, first question, can black holes themselves be a significant uh, contributor uh, to dark matter? Uh, following the recent discoveries of binary black hole mergers with tens of uh, uh, solar masses, um, interest was revived in the possibility of primordial black holes coming from the very early universe, but for instance, uh, density fluctuations in the early universe, uh, uh, QCD phase transition, whatever you, have, you may have, uh, for masses in the range of, point, let's say, 0.1 to 100 solar masses. Um, if you have a 3G detector, then you can look at, then you can measure the mass spectrum, so to speak, or the mass distribution of black holes rather uh, uh, carefully. And should you see an excess uh, at some mass, then that could be indicative of primordial black holes. Um, also, if you were to see uh, binary black holes merge at a huge redshift, which you can with Einstein telescopes, say you see, the, you see a binary black hole merger at a redshift of 20, then you know that these black holes cannot have been formed from stars because there were no stars yet, so they would have to be primordial as well. 
Um, by the way, the question of whether primordial black holes exist can also be divorced, divorced from the question of how much they contribute to the dark, dark matter, right? I mean, indications are that they, they will contribute to only a small fraction, but also by itself, the question do primordial black holes exist is an interesting one. Secondly, um, even if dark matter just consists mostly of particles, uh, some heavy particle, um, can they, can, do they have some effect on, on uh, uh, binary uh, compact uh, coalescence? And the answer is potentially yes. So dark, dark matter particles might accumulate around ordinary black holes, and then you can have a sort of gravitational drag uh, that uh, uh, can accumulate over many orbits, which is also uh, an incentive to have LISA and, for instance, Einstein Telescope or Cosmic Explorer operational at the same time, because then you, you will be able to follow a binary over many, many cycles from very low frequencies all the way to whatever the merger frequency will be. Um, another possibility is the accumulation of dark matter particles in the cores of neutron stars, which, event, which eventually make those neutron stars collapse to black holes. So if you see an, 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 an overabundance of very light black holes, then that might be indicative of that process. And then finally, also already mentioned yesterday, new light particles I'm just, I'm almost done. New light particles might also manifest themselves. If you have some light scalar with an extremely small mass in this range here, which corresponds to Compton wavelengths uh, uh, of the size of stellar mass black holes or supermassive black holes, then they can extract rotational energy from, the black, from a Kerr black hole uh, due to a process called superradiance and form condensates. And those condenses that now surround, uh, let's say, a binary black hole, again, have an impact on the dynamics. When, they, when the, the uh, boson clouds annihilate, you will have continuous waves. And then uh, if all the black holes in the universe are doing this, then uh, they can add up to some sort of stochastic background. And so, well, I'll leave you with uh, the summary here. Dark, uh, in the nature of dark energy as well, right? I mean, if we can measure the variation of Hubble parameter versus uh, redshift. Yeah, that is right, yeah. So uh, there are the ideas that you use binaries as uh, standard candles or standard sirens, as, as we call them in, uh, in, in our world. And so it is possible to get the distance to the source directly from the gravitational wave signal, as you know. And if then you have a way to separately measure the redshift, you can probe the distance redshift relationship. If you can do that out to large redshift, which requires 3G uh, instruments, then uh, you can get uh, density of matter, density of dark energy, also dark energy equation of state. Yeah, so when you talked about echoes, um, uh, you mentioned uh, the final object uh, that's formed, uh, you know, you're testing it for whether it's a wormhole or, or something like Gravistar and things like that. But, but the earlier part of uh, what we have detected is very consistent with a binary black hole merger, right? So why would you even bother to explore with the final object as a wormhole? Yeah, well, it depends on compactness, actually. So uh, if you have extremely compact objects uh, inspiring together, forming again an extremely compact object, then you know, with the accuracies we have now, you may not be able to, uh, in the inspiral, for instance, you may not be able with current instruments to uh, distinguish them from black holes. Remember, for instance, that uh, in the case of uh, the Poisonian parameters here, the best bound we have, other than forget about the minus one PN, but for, for the other uh, PN parameters, the bound we, bounds we currently have are not yet that good. So there, there is, there, I think there is room for exotic things to happen. Add something? Yeah. Um, I think the other way is during the in-spiral stage, the frequency of the wave is very low, and then the potential barrier of the black hole is very reflective. So therefore, these perturbations really don't enter the horizon region so much until you are near the uh, ring down stage, where the two guys are merging, and there's more wave going down the horizon, the direction of the horizon. So that makes the ring down makes the final stage much more uh, promising in testing. Slide up here, I sort of this conceptual question. If in fact post Newtonian series were convergent, absolutely convergent, then this makes complete sense. I mean, this is what it, but it is only an asymptotic series. So it could be, for example, that the 4.5 pn coefficient is really larger and therefore, um, I mean, 
what it might appear as if it is a correction, delta something. If, if I compare with the observations, okay, I have the correct theory up to 4.5, I calculate and you know, I see that in fact there should be some effect. You have only up to 3.5 and you try to fit the data of 3.5 and you might find a deviation. But that might actually be because you're ignoring something. So I always find this a little bit uh, not satisfactory and I just wanted to know if I'm missing something. Well, I think the, um, with, with the sensitivities we, we have right now, and with the theoretical and numerical experiments that have been done, uh, I think we can be reasonably certain that at least the GR waveforms we have now, in the very early inspiral, they do follow the post-Newtonian formalism. Uh, as I mentioned, actually, uh, the merger ringdown can also be characterized by uh, uh, certain parameters that, that are input from numerical relativity. Again, with the current sensitivity of detectors and with what we have learned from analytical relativity as well as uh, uh, numerical simulations, I think we are reasonably safe in doing these kinds of experiments. The future might be different. Can I just make an additional comment that I think uh, if we see a violation of GR, I, I don't think immediately we actually conclude it's a violation of GR. Would, we would rather examine all the assumptions that have gone into testing. I think that's, that's right. It's, it's not immediately clear that we would jump into that conclusion. But I would contend that we're not yet. I mean, we're, we're, at this stage, you know, it is yeah. possible to to find violations of GR. Uh, you know, again, given the uh, given the sensitivity of our detectors, of course, that that violation would have to be strong enough to show up. That's never. But but none of this regime is tested by any other means, exactly. and therefore. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so, uh, it, okay, state my question again. If the, if in fact post newtonian theory were absolutely convergent series, then saying that there's a GR effect, GR result, and then I correct it with some delta parameters, and then I can compare and see what happens. That I would agree with, because we, then we know that the, that the term which is of the next order is really smaller than the term which is of the previous order. But in fact, we already know, right? I mean, from the 2, 2.5 post newtonian theory that the terms of the higher order can dominate in terms of the lower order here. So I think, I don't see why there is any reason to, come, to be confident that of higher, the coefficient of the higher order term would not be much larger uh, than, but I think we, we can talk about it later. Oh, can I comment some more? Where are you? Uh, I think here these coefficients are not the real post-Newtonian coefficients. They're, we've, we basically have these few terms and we calibrate the coefficients to numerical relativity simulations. So we make sure our baseline coefficients have very, very good fit with the GR waveform. Or and more precisely, the, the, uh, you know, these are post-Newtonian-like coefficients uh, that are in, embedded in an in-spiral merger ringdown waveform that has been tested to you know, great, with great success against NR waveforms, uh, for right. instance. So therefore, if you have any deviation here, it'll, it'll show, it'll mean it's a deviation from the GR waveform. So, is it that you can detect any kind of structure at the Planck scale, or has it to be of a very specific sort which gives rise to echoes, like you mentioned an empty shell or, uh, so is it sort of relatively independent of the nature of the features you might see at the horizon? Uh, well, I would say that uh, theoretical, theoretical calculation at, at this point are rather pre preliminary. So they usually take the form of you have some uh, central object and a light object is, uh, so an extreme mass ratio in other words, uh, not, not quite the kind of objects we are uh, observing now. Um, but, uh, and also uh, usually spherical symmetry is assumed for that central object, but within, you know, those assumptions, it seems that for a wide class of alternative objects that people have cooked up, again, you know, whether they're well motivated or not is a, is a separate question, but for the kinds of objects that people have cooked up, if they are, if they are sufficiently compact so that the photon sphere is sticking out, but not so compact that they are a Schwarzschild black hole, then echoes seem to be ubiquitous. We should uh, move on to the next talk. There will be discussion after the three talks.